I'm sure we all know the fairy tale about the little boy who cried wolf, but I thought that it was relevant to what I want to talk about today. So let's just do a little quick recap. So the boy who cried wolf, um, I suspect they were some sort of air sign or maybe an Aries, just bored on the job. And their job was to watch out over the fields and to call out to the townspeople. One assumes, you know, some farmers with weapons that could come if there was a wolf that was attacking the sheep or whatever livestock it was. This young gent is bored one day and he decides to, to cry out wolf, that there's a wolf immediately coming. And so everyone comes running and there's no wolf to be seen. And, you know, he's laughing, giggling away uh, at the lovely joke he's played on everyone. Got everyone to come running and there's nothing going on. So... One assumes, you know, a few more weeks go by, and he's bored again. So, he does the same thing. Calls wolf, and everyone comes running. And again, to their chagrin, there is no wolf. So, another few weeks go by, but this time a rustling comes. And out of the bushes comes an actual, honest-to-goodness wolf, with very hungry eyes, snarling teeth, And it's looking at these sheep as if it has not eaten in quite some time, and it it intends to very soon. So, the boy actually called to his duty, calls Wolf as loud as he can. He blows his horn, he stomps his feet, he yells at the top of his lungs, and no one shows up. Why? Well, because they didn't believe him anymore. So... One assumes that the sheep get eaten and then, you know, they do discover. We don't, no one talks about what happens after the events because the moral of the story is don't lie. Don't bullshit people. Don't, you know, don't bear false witness as the Bible would have it. Um, And also, and, and especially, I think one of the messages is don't call alarm. Don't get people worked up. You know, that's why we, you're not allowed to say fire in a crowded place. Don't actually have people concerned and worried. I mean, jokes are okay. Sure. But to repeatedly get people in a, in a tizzy, basically over what amounts to be nothing, well, that's just not good policy. And I think, you know, more simply, it's don't lie, but I think it also means more than that. But what they don't talk about is another one of the underpinnings of this story. And I think all stories with morals, there's two sides to it, or more than two sides. There's many things that can be gleaned from it. Another one in this case is, Sometimes, you have to believe someone who's told you untruths before. Sometimes, people tell you that a danger is coming, that the sky is falling, and then the sky actually does fall. So, the other message, besides don't be a shitty person and tell lies, is what you think may never happen could actually happen. It's not on you if someone lies and you believe them. Because we're supposed to believe each other. We're supposed to tell the truth, right? We are not wired to be constantly on guard against lies, and we should not be. Sometimes, you have to just look at the circumstances around you, look at the evidence, and make your determination based on what is in front of you, not on what has happened in the past, or what has been said to you by anyone in the past. Why am I telling you this story? Well, I think we're at one of those points right now. For many, many elections, it's basically been like, well, you have to vote for this person or the, this person's going to absolutely destroy the world. And, you know, that's, that's basically how, since we have a two party system and you know how I feel about that shit. But since we have basically what amounts to a two party system, uh, each of the sides has said that the other one was going to bring about the absolute ruin of the world and everything if you let them win. Now, in this case, I think it's actually sort of true. And it sounds hyperbolic, but sometimes the sky really is falling. There have definitely been tumultuous times in history. Through the first civil rights movement and through the AIDS crisis and the crack epidemic and And there's been a great many things. I mean, there's always something happening in the world. But this time is different. This is not, it is not crying wolf to suggest that the current time and the current situation is much more vital, much more dangerous, much more severe than anything we've previously seen. 
and we do need to act accordingly. And I'm going to get into a bit how we need to react to it, because, spoiler alert, it's not just voting. It's really not just voting. But it's also not not voting. And I want to basically explain to you why there actually is a wolf at the door. And of course, you know how I feel about real wolves. Real wolves are not dangerous unless they're starved out by humans, but you know what I mean. But let's get started. My name is Logan Grendel, and you have returned to the Focused on Infinity podcast. Let's talk about it. So it has been a while, and there have been many ups and downs in the world, and in my own life, and I'm sure in yours. But here we are. And before I get into the main topic of it, I wanted to quickly touch on the last topic, which was my cousin Kenneth and his case. So I want to first say that I I believe that we on the left do need to use emotion more. We are often accused of being too emotional and of working on histrionics rather than facts. And the right loves to say, you know, the idiotic shit like facts don't care about your feelings. But the truth is, if you actually look at the reality of it, it's the right that's acting on emotions. Almost always, they're acting on fear of the other. They're acting on you know, the fear that someone's going to come and take what's theirs, they're acting on their parents' emotions, right? Because they believe in preserving or conserving the things that have gone before. Well, what they're doing is they're acting on essentially childish emotions. Rather than thinking about the world as it is now, rather on thinking about the people that are in the world, rather on thinking about how things should be, they think about how things were and how to keep them as they were. That is never fact-based. The saying, reality has a leftist bias, is very true. Because as things change, as you know more, usually you need to change things on a wide level to fit the world that is currently in front of you. Right? By the way, I'm trying something new with this podcast. I'm going to just go. And previously, I've done a lot of editing. So, it's going to sound a little bit more free-flowing than it has in the past. And... I want to do more podcasts and I want to give you more content. And also, I want to be a little bit more authentic, essentially, in my voice. So, uh, it is what it is. You'll hear me say a lot more strange things and, you know, um, a lot more, more pauses. But I want you to really be with me as I'm thinking about these things. So, anyway, let's keep going. Meanwhile, on the left, what we're doing is we're looking at conditions in the world, right? We're looking at the world around us and we're looking, well, okay, There's people hungry. How do we get them food? Right? There's people who can't afford medicine. There's people who don't have homes. Right? So we're looking at conditions and thinking, well, what do we do? What do we need to change in the world to improve the conditions of the world? Right? And yes, there is emotion to that too, because the other thing is that emotion is in everything we do. Anyone who thinks otherwise is selling you something. And it's not something you want to buy. But every emotion is in everything that we do, right? But it's not purely emotion. It's also, okay, well, what's our plan? And that's why there is so much more division on the left. Because on the left, we're actually thinking about, okay, well, what's the best way to do this? You know, do we want to uproot the entire thing and burn it to the ground? Or do we want to take pieces apart? Right. I heard a saying the other day. It was, you know, the reason there is more discussion and more infighting on the left than on the right is because there is more lack of agreement between engineers and architects than there is among arsonists. Because we're trying to build something, right? We're trying to make the world better. At least those of us that genuinely are on the left and not those that are, you know, conservatives masquerading as liberals, which there are far too fucking many of you, and uh, y'all are about to get outed. But anyway, so in this world that we're trying to create, right, sometimes we need to be, we do need to appeal to emotion. Because so many times I have been told 
that I was doing a, a little boy cried wolf or a chicken little, or I was just overstating the danger that we're in, right? I remember posting something with all of my evidence comparing 45 to Hitler. And this was in like late 2015, early 2016. And most people just looked at me like I was crazy because even people who weren't going to vote for him definitely did not see the danger, right? They were just like, he's terrible and he grabs people's pussies, right? But they weren't like, no, this dude is a, is definitely a fascist and a lot of the stuff about him makes me certain that when he gets into office, he's going to do some fascist fuck shit. But all the evidence was there, right? But also, sometimes you just need to grab someone and shake them and say, we got to go, we got to move, we got to do something. And you need to appeal to just emotion just to get people moving. Because, I mean, that's why, that's why clickbait works, right? Because we are at base, creatures that work on emotion. And unfortunately, the right has been able to use and hack that much better than the left has. And we need to do a much better job of that. Now, I'm not saying we should tell outright lies because we don't need to. Because the things that we want are good. Because we do have a benevolence to our general outlook, right? But we, A, need to appeal to emotion more to get people excited. And not just excited about fear, but about the love that we have. Right? And also, we need to be able to reprimand each other. And not reprimand each other for dumb things, but that's all a part of love. Love is also saying to someone, you fucked up and you need to do better. Somebody that loves you, really, will say that to you at some point. Because we all fuck up. And sometimes need to be corrected. So, in the last episode, I was really feeling it. And I still am, because he's still in there, right? And the long and short of it is, he has no appeal. I have got some, I got some great advice, uh, thanks to a very, very excellent friend of mine, you know who you are, and you are awesome, uh, who did a lot of groundwork and talked to a bunch of lawyers and stuff, and basically got a lot of the answers that I thought we would get, which is that at some point in the process, he had been cajoled, coerced into taking a plea. And that plea essentially supersedes every other fact, every other thing about the case. So, am I still trying to get him out? Yes, absolutely. But what I understand now is that even though through the law, right? Because the law is a bunch of things on paper. And that's why they get people to take pleas. Just on the subject, we backtracked and found out that he's had a few lawyers over, and this has been going on uh, since around 2012, uh, 2013. Nope. Yeah, 2013. And his first lawyer basically just got him to sign the plea and then left the case, dropped the case and gave him an oil, another lawyer. And that second lawyer was with him for a good while. And then he left as well for another one. And since he has been back in the States, he has not seen his new lawyer one time. Okay, he has not been contacted. He's had several court dates, all of which have been adjourned, but he still hasn't spoken to this new lawyer, right? So, this is a multi-stage failure of our system. And to say it's a failure is, uh, is generous, because we all know that the system is not intended to provide any justice to certain people. It's there to protect power, and there is absolutely no way, especially after seeing everything that's gone on this year, right? The the situation with Breonna Taylor. And I was called a, a gloom cookie, basically, for being like, they're, they're not going to get anything for this, because on the books, they did nothing wrong. We all know they did something wrong. We all know they murdered this woman in her bed in cold blood, yes. And we also know, and never let them forget this, that the reason that it was done was for a gentrification project. This was this is tied in to a lot more than just a no-knock raid. That was all a pretext. They wanted her to be out of that apartment so they could jack up the price and rent it to somebody who was going to pay more money. 
So this, it's darker even than we give it credit for being because it goes deeper than just police brutality and police violence. It is the intersection of police brutality and police violence and also the crushing weight of capitalism destroying everyone that it needs to in order to get more money, in order to make more money for the capital owners. And if you're still defending capitalism at this point, your Stockholm Syndrome needs to fucking go. Okay? It's not crony capitalism. It's not unchecked capitalism. It's just capitalism. You cannot have a system that is based around money that is used to govern humans. No one is saying you shouldn't have commerce. No one is saying you shouldn't have trade. Because that's something that there should always be and there always will be amongst people. The division of labor, the division of talents, right? There has to be a way that we can share and trade and also just some of us want to better our condition. That is, that's inborn in some of us. You know, a lot of us got Capricorn placements, right? But there is a way to do that without destroying everything you touch. The game Monopoly, I've said this before, the game Monopoly was not originally, I mean, it was made basically as propaganda against capitalism. Because there's only one way that game ends. The more money you have, the easier it is for you to squeeze other people out of business. There's only one gateway that that game ends. And there's only one way that capitalism ends. Right? Case in point, we're in the middle of a global pandemic. Most of us have no money. Most of us have no options. And, and our law, I mean, our lawmakers aren't giving us shit. $1,200 for seven months? Come on now. We are a global laughingstock because of this. And that's why we have the worst numbers in COVID deaths. And it's not because people are bad or because they don't know how to wear masks, which, I mean, (laughs) let's, let's get, let's not get it twisted. They are and they don't. But it would be easier to get people to do the right thing if their conditions were better. Right. If we had been given enough money just to stay at home for two months, everybody stay at home. Right. Do like they did in China and don't give me any shit about China being too much. Right. What they had in China, they had the fucking cops delivering food to people because there were no people on the street. Okay, so it's not hard. It's easy. We just don't have the political will to do it because of our notion of dog-eat-dog unchecked capitalism. So, getting back to this case, his lawyers, they've worse than failed him, right? The second guy, I think, was was pretty all right, to his credit. But the first guy, his job was basically just to, he was there to be the good cop to the cop's bad cop. He was there to be the, and, and you know, and I, I spoke to Kenneth, and he said, you know, the guy said, there's no way you're going to win this case. Just take this plea and you'll be good to go. And, and you know, and after being in jail for who knows how long, after who knows whatever happening to him, right? He just wanted to get out of there like anyone would. Like anyone would. So, one of the things, however, that in all the information that I got that, I mean, it frankly just made me super angry at liberals again, because a lot of these well-off liberals who responded to the message that we sent out, they were just like, yeah, well, you know, according to the law, this is the law. And so he's just stuck with it. He's just got to be in there because he took the plea. So there's nothing we can do. Yo, what was the point of becoming lawyers? What was the point of going into law and justice if you're just going to fucking roll over for every bad law that there is and not fight, not find some way for people to get better conditions? Okay, you're not fighting for anyone, if you see a law that is completely unjust and you just roll over. Yeah, I know what the fucking law is. I knew before I made the last episode that he had probably taken a plea. Does that mean we still shouldn't be lighting up the governor's office and and everyone basically who could just give him a pardon based on the fact that he is a Marine, he is a, a good dude who had no, no criminal record as a kid, then went to the military and came back and bam, right? Dude was on the way to school. He was on the way to school when he jumped that, allegedly, jumped the turnstile. Okay? 
So, and, and I hate that we even have to put his resume out there, that he was a Marine, et cetera, et cetera, that all these things, you know, because no one should be in jail for jumping a turnstile. No one should jump. No one should be in bad situations, worse situations, because they don't have money. No one. But that's the way that we, we all have adopted especially those of us who have gotten a little bit closer to money and power. And I'm going to keep it a buck with you. Y'all are standing in the way right now. When when leftists, when deep leftists are like, yo, let's burn this whole shit down because it's it's not doing any good for anyone, because people are dying, because we're killing people, because, you know, X, Y, and Z are happening. Well, a lot of these people who they went to the college, right, they went to grad school, they got their degrees, they bought into the system. And so they're like, no, I don't want to, I don't want to entirely burn down the system because like in this new world, maybe I won't get to be a PhD or a lawyer. And, and basically I have earned a way to be better than other people. And I know that's not how everyone thinks, but there is a deep, deep classism that runs through a lot of that thinking. Right. And I know that some of y'all don't realize you have it, but what you do doesn't make you better than anyone else. Okay. Especially when you don't factor in. And yeah, I know you had to work hard to get it. And, and honestly, that's, that's another one of the ways that they get you. That's one of the ways they beat you down. College in some ways is like the entire experience of college is partially like fr fraternity hazing is in a much shorter period of time, right? They put you in these conditions where the amount of work that you get given and like you're in, like they just ring you out, right? And, and why they ring you out? Because what they're doing is they are preparing you for a life of working your ass off for 40 years until you retire. Working your ass off and consuming and being a good cog in the system for 40 years. And how they do that, they break you down, they put you through this experience that like, frankly, look, I love learning things. I spend hours, most days, just, you know, watching news or reading things or, you know, catching, most of the stuff I do, like I don't even watch a lot of the fun shows, right? Because I would rather hear another episode of Democracy Now!, Right. Or listen to some other podcast or like Rev Left Radio or something like that. Something where I can learn something. And learning is a lifelong process and it should be. But college is a peculiar commodification of the notion of learning that is definitely classist. So a lot of people that have gone through their eight years of schooling, they think that, that somehow that makes them like that degree makes them inherently better than someone without one. You know, people find out that I don't have a college degree, they're kind of like turned off by it, you know, as if, oh, well, you know, you were cool before and like we had great intellectual conversations before, but now that I know you don't have the piece of paper that you paid like $300,000 for, well, I respect you less now, right? And what people don't realize is that that means you have actually bought into the system. Even if you intended to fight against the system from within the system, right, you still have somehow bought into it. And so it's really hard to get some people to be like, yeah, this shit ain't good. And just because he took this plea, well, we got to still find some way to get this dude out of here because he shouldn't be in there. Because you've been beaten. You've been broken by the system. You have come to accept that legality and morality are somehow the same or if they're not the same thing, there's just nothing you can do about it. And if there's nothing you can do about it, what's the point of you? What are you doing? Because if you're a lawyer, you know they're going to fucking get somebody caught up on a plea deal. What I want everyone to keep doing for Kenneth, if you're on Twitter, let's try and get free Ken B trending. And whenever you think about it, just, you know, throw a little tweet and at Governor Cuomo, because he could get, I mean, he could just pardon him. He could just pardon him, right? And I know this seems like it's just about one person, 
but I want to help get a lot of these bullshit rules overturned and taken out. And that's going to require making a lot of noise about it. A whole lot of noise about it. More than I can do alone with the reach that I have. So I am again enlisting your help. Keep the pressure on. And, and listen, if you have someone in your life who is in jail for a similar situation, right? It doesn't even have to be free can be. Put free that person and at the governor. Because these motherfuckers are sleeping too calmly for the essential evil that they are doing or allowing to be done. Especially right now. If it doesn't make you absolutely infuriated that our legislators are just, they just leave. They're, they should not have taken one fucking single day off during this entire pandemic. And they've taken long breaks, long, long breaks. Okay. None of us have gotten that kind of a long break. Most of us are just trying to live. But these are the people who have been there. They have one job. Their one job is to represent the people and they do not fucking do it. So my campaign is to continue to put pressure on and getting his story out. He's currently writing, uh, a, a, some, you know, something about his entire experience that I'm going to help him disseminate. And we're going to just keep on getting the word out there. And I hope that you will help us continue to do that because his story is just, it's too much like all the other stories, not all the other stories, but really most of the other stories about people who are in jail. They're in jail for some bullshit. They're in these terrible, inhumane, dirty, disgusting, violent conditions for reasons of legal fiction. Because someone put them in a room for 20 hours, yelled in their face and didn't feed them and, and got them to sign a piece of paper saying that they had done something that they did not do just so they could get another person into a prison bed and make more money for fucking geo group or core civic or whatever the fuck it's called now. That shit is the deepest of injustices. And if you are in the legal profession and your response to the story, a story like this is, well, he did this or that. And so, oh, well, nothing we can do. What's the point of you being in that job? Is it just because that was, you know, your parents said you had to be a doctor or a lawyer. You chose lawyer. You wanted to have a, a job, made you enough money to have a nice house, raise a family. That's it. Meanwhile, you're super close to the levers of power by being a lawyer. Come on now. I'm done with that. Getting back to the actual topic of today's podcast. We're in some shit, folks. We really are. It's deep and it's bad. And there are a lot of people that still don't think that Donald Trump is that big a threat. Now, I'm not telling you how to vote because, as I've said before, you know, voting is the absolute least we, we can do. And, you know, I strongly believe in voting for all local races, every single one, because that's how any world we want to see will be run, right? So, I've made myself clear many times how I feel about voting in general and also how I feel about voting in specific with this system that it's mostly theater because especially the higher up you go, the more controlled it is, the more voter suppression there is, the more voter purges there are. And it is on both sides. Both sides do the voter, the voter roll purges and the provisional ballots that don't get counted. Both sides do that, right? So the likelihood of Donald Trump winning again is very, very high, and not because he will get more votes, but because, look, the way that we want things to work is not how they work. Nobody cares who got more votes in the last election. That's not how it works. I don't care who gets more votes this election. The only thing that matters is the Electoral College. That's all that matters in this system. So, putting all of our, you know, all the focus on voting, like, got to make sure to vote, got to make sure to vote, but we're not talking about anything else. We're not talking about the fact that like entire jurisdictions, potentially states in this country, win or lose with this president, right? Win or lose could be taken over by essentially right-wing terrorists. 
right? The Bundys were kind of, uh, and uh, if you don't remember the Bundys, it was like this group that took over a government building, armed to the teeth, and, you know, claiming to be like, you know, we're going to be self-sufficient and blah, blah, blah. But then they had people like trying to send them snacks because they hadn't prepared <laughs> well enough for how they were going to feed themselves. But it was like the, the, you know, people were like aghast because they had done an armed takeover of, of a federally owned building. And the cops did not go in there guns blazing like they were doing at Standing Rock or like they did at Occupy or like they in general do because it was a bunch of white good old boys. So, what do you think is going to happen? And now, look, we've seen what happened with, you know, Kyle Rittenhouse, right? This fucking kid illegally comes across state lines with a gun, kills two people, and walks the fuck away. I mean, literally walked by the cops. He even went up to one of the cops to be like, hey, yo, what's up? I just shot someone. And they were like, get out of here, kid. Like, we don't, you know, don't be seen with us. And he just fucking walks off into the night with the fucking weapon still smoking. People still bleeding behind him. Okay. Meanwhile, a motherfucker can't jump a turnstile because he's late for school without getting his ass beat. And why is that? Have we accepted? Have we actually learned that America is and always has been a right wing fascist country? We're saying that fascism is on the ballot as if it hasn't been in our laws. What the fuck is Jim Crow but fascism? What the fuck is slavery but fascism? I mean, seriously. And and don't get hung up on the, like, well, in the dictionary, it says that fascism means... That, that's not what we're fucking talking about, okay? You know what I mean. We're talking about a state where might makes right. Where certain segments of the population are brutally treated... And anyone in the state can be brutally treated if they don't go along with the state, right? So, you know, Michael Reinhold, rest in power to Michael Reinhold. This dude, using his Second Amendment rights at a protest, shot a right-wing counter-protester who was literally threatening his life and the life of the people around him. Now, we all know what would have happened if the shoe had been on the other foot, right? But in this case, 45 literally sent U.S. Marshals to this dude's house and shot him to death. And they couldn't, I mean, he wasn't, he wasn't pointing a gun at anyone. Eyewitnesses say that at the time of his murder, he was eating a gummy worm. Okay, so... I mean, I don't, I don't know what sort of strange anime ninja movie it would be where someone uses a gummy worm as a deadly weapon against a bunch of U.S. Marshals, right? But they did not have to shoot this guy, riddle him with bullets, at very least. They could have brought him in, like they did Kyle Rittenhouse, like they did Dylan Roof. So, the fact that they did not, and the fact that, look, he literally bragged about it, Okay. I'm not going to actually, I could put the clip of him saying it in here, but I don't, none of you want to hear his voice and I don't want to put it in here. So I'm just going to paraphrase what he said, but something to the effect of, you know, I, we asked them when they were going to go in and get this guy and they didn't go in and get him. So I sent in the U.S. Marshals, bing, bang, boom, the guy's fucking dead now. So whatever flavor of leftist or whatever flavor of politics you do support, you know, and if you're the sort of person that thinks that, you know, the, all the discussions of, of his fascism, of of 45's fascism, Nazism, racism are overstated, like, he literally just killed a dude. And it was extra judicial. And nothing's going to happen to those cops, because they were literally ordered by the president. The president ordered someone killed, and they were killed. Now, has that happened before? All the fucking time. Now, like, that's not what we're saying here. We're not going there with it, right? Because you and I both know, right? The original, the Black Lives Matter movement, the original version of it, as it first was getting kicked off, right? 2015-ish, whatever. Under Obama, 2014, 2015, whatever it was. 
a lot of those activists are not alive anymore, right? Now, do I think that was from the federal level? I don't know. It probably was from more local levels because we know that, you know, cops and Klan hand in hand. It's not even, you can't walk hand in hand with yourself. It's not even that they go hand in hand. It's that they're the same fucking people, right? The blue is what they wear during the day and the white is what they wear at night. So, or on the weekend or whatever. And some towns in this country are still sundown towns. And if you don't know what a sundown town is, that's basically a town where if you drove through as a black person during the day, stop for gas or whatever, somebody would come up to you and be like, don't get caught here after, after sundown. And if you knew what was good for you and you wanted to live, you would heed them because that town was governed by white supremacists and they would kill you if they caught you at night. And there still are sundown towns in this country. Ain't a damn thing changed in that regard, right? So the racism of this country cannot be overstated. And our last president, right? He wasn't himself racist, right? Obviously. Well, no, I mean, I don't, I don't know about obviously, but you know, he was not himself a racist, but he presided over a racist system. So racist things just kept fucking happening under him as well. And that's the kind of thing that we're dealing with right now, right? People who think that a Biden and Trump presidency would be exactly the same, they're not as wrong as people try and say they are. Because, look, the beatings will not stop under whoever comes into office. I mean, that's just the facts, right? Uh, recently, Rachel Maddow shared a picture. I believe it was Rachel Maddow. Don't quote me on that and I will check, but shared a picture of the kids sleeping under mylar blankets, uh, at border detention centers. And it actually turns out to have been from the previous administration, right? So they weren't doing it as directly, evilly, and with the same vicious intention, though, though slightly, right? Because deterrence has always been part of the immigration policy, I mean, not always, but for a good long time, right? Deterrence through difficulty has been the stated policy of, of our government, right? But you can have, you can not be yourself racist, but still help racism and white supremacy. And that's what happened under the last presidency. But is that worse than being under an actual white supremacist? Of course not. And it is intellectually disingenuous or, or maybe you're just, you know, trying not to see it. But leo neoliberalism always does lead to fascism. I mean, that's true. Liberalism always leads to fascism because liberalism is capitalist and capitalism always leads to fascism because after a certain point, after you have taken everything from people, they start to rise up, and so you start need to crack down more. So you create more mechanisms and levers to crack down, and those mechanisms and levers become entrenched in the, in the laws, and it always escalates until all that is left is force to crack down on the people. And force becomes what your government provides most. And whoever's presiding over this government, the thing this government provides best is force. Force at home and force abroad. Right? So, that's what we have. And that's the government that we have. But who do we want it in the hands of? Do we want it in the hands of a feck feckless neoliberal? Or someone who sees the tools and goes, hmm, well, I mean, <laughs> there's already all these knives here and I love to stab people. Why don't I just go with stabbing? I can stab a whole lot of people with all these knives. I tell you what right? That's what we're, that's what we're facing. And also, look, again, what I'm talking about now is not voting because, let me clarify, my vote for the president line of the ticket does not matter. New York is going to go blue. The electoral votes for president from New York State are going to go to Joe Biden. So, Obviously, your vote for the down ticket things matters and whatever, whatever. But what I'm talking about is not just the electoral end of things. 
What I'm talking about is most of the people who I see talking about making sure to get active and vote don't have any plan for fascism, don't know what they will do when things kick up, and they're going to. There is no getting the genie back in the bottle for all these right-wing nut jobs that are there, all these South Shore Rise Again people, all the people who basically are so spiritually and emotionally broken by capitalism that they have internalized it and are ready to force it down everyone else's throats like it's been forced down theirs because they feel like that's all they have left to do. They're ready. And you know what? And they're tired. And I have a little bit, just part of me has a little bit of compassion for them because these are people who they probably have creative impulses. You know, a lot of them probably have some, some things they want to express that they've never been able to express. And the world around them was like, you cannot express that or you will be ostracized. You will not make any money. And at some point they just gave up and they bought in. And that's why what we're dealing with essentially is a death cult. People who are willing to die basically on the altar of capitalism because not because they're not just because they're evil or whatever but because they're broken there's nothing worse than a person who has given up because they have been broken and behind all of these militia nuts right and i mean yes you do have a small percentage of people that are just they just want to go out and hurt people and do damage they're genuinely sadistic and that's just all they want right but a lot of these people what it, what really is undergirding all of it is deep, deep sadness. And, you know, especially what we're talking about these like, you know, middle aged 50 year old dudes, you know, 50, 60 year old dudes who for their whole lives, they've just, they've towed the line. They did what they were, you know, air quotes, supposed to have done. Right. And now the only thing left they can do is defend it because, well, what else can I do? Right. And I, yeah, I mean, I know this guy sounds kind of bad and like, I don't, you know, if I really think about it, what they're doing to these kids is terrible, but you know what? I'm in too deep now. I was talking to someone earlier and we were talking about, you know, how they get you with like fraternities and with police and with the military and, and it's not the first time they get you to do something. It's the first time they get you to watch someone else doing something and you don't, and there's nothing you can do about it, right? You're at the fraternity and that one real asshole who's just a terrible person, well, they decide they're going to drug someone's drink and they do and you know it's happening. Your choices at that point are, well, I've already gone through the hazing and I've already gone through all this and I'm already, like, I did all this work to get into this fraternity. My choices are either to leave and be ostracized from my group or to just not say anything. And once you don't say anything, that's when they got you. Because the next time it'll be easier not to say anything. And then when they ask you to join in, you might just join in. That's really the chilling part of all this, right? But then, and, and at that point, you're broken. A lot of the good in you has been broken because the natural instinct when you see something like that happen is to literally throw yourself physically and violently at whoever's doing it and getting them to stop at all costs. That is the natural instinct. But once you don't do that one time, then they got you. And that, you know, literally and metaphorically is a lot of how our society gets people to buy in. But when you really get deep in, to, to get out again, it's just, you have so much you think that you need to give up. And also, you begin to hate yourself. I believe that a lot of this, I believe that a lot of these people, you know, and I, even that's people like, you know, like your Candace Owensons of the world. And I have a standing rule. Like, I don't argue with black women online. Even if I disagree with them, they're super wrong. Because black women get enough shit, Right. I'm like, you know what? I don't agree with you, but I'm not going to argue with you. Not here, right? Maybe if we were sitting at a table, I would have this argument with you, but I'm not going to do that here. But for Candace Owens, I will make a fucking exception. She hates herself. And that's clear, right? She, for money, at, I mean, she's very talented at speaking. Very talented at arguing. 
And I don't mean that in like the racist way that people mean it when they say that black people are erudite, obviously. Uh, I mean that literally she's very talented at creating arguments, right? And she's quick witted. But for money, she's agreed to sell out everyone and everything. And I don't just mean her blackness. I mean, she is, she capes for capitalism. She capes for anti-blackness, whatever it is. She's being paid well for it. And there's no way that you'll ever see her just recant everything because that, that self-hatred metastasizes daily, right? That first little bit of guilt that you get for doing something unscrupulous for money or for whatever reason, to not be ostracized, whatever. That first little bit of guilt, okay, after that first thing, you're still redeemable, right? But then you keep adding little pebbles of guilt and it gets pushed down, pushed down. You never express it to anyone because you can't. And it begins to form in, you know, like, like little bits of coal slowly becoming diamond over years. It, it hardens and hardens until it metastasizes into this essentially like core diamond of hatred. And it's turned at the self, but then it turns outward at everyone else too. And then you end up just being a hateful person. And you become a genuine villain. At the core of every villain is self-hatred. That's why one becomes a villain instead of a hero. Right? Um, we'll talk about Chiron, the wounded healer. Some at the, It's an asteroid at some point. But anyway, so... This is how they get you. We're dealing with a death cult because a lot of people, once they get to that point where they're in so deep down the murderous, rapacious, essentially evil rabbit hole of hating other people and helping other people destroy other people, they, I mean, the amount of pain it would cause them to admit they were wrong, the amount of pain it would cause them to just give it all up and admit that they had done unforgivable, unspeakable things. They just can't do it. And so they would literally rather die than admit it. And that's, that, again, that might sound hyperbolic, but really think about it logically. It's the truth. These people would rather go out on their shield than really think about whether or not black people are worth life. Because deep down, they know that all people, they listen, every racist person in their life, I don't give a fuck how racist you are. If you live in this country, you'll at some point have crossed paths with a person from the group you hate, where you had a human experience with them that was positive, right? No matter what you do later, when you go back to your peer group, you've had experiences that have shaken you. And you won't admit to it, of course, but you know it's there. And you remember back to your childhood, the innocence. Everyone has in them the knowledge that I saw a great uh, tweet the other day, and it said something to the effect of, socialism is the natural state, right? Ask a child, ask a young child if they think everyone should get food and a place to sleep and enough money to live on. And the odds that any of them will say no is pretty fucking slim. Because that's the natural way of things. And of course, I balk at the word natural, but I think, you know, follow along with me here. Um, that's the way that we are. But it gets beaten out of us. That notion of cooperation and gentleness gets beaten out of us. And then, to various degrees, we become stormtroopers. And, and in, in some cases, that means, you know, some of the liberal lawyers I was talking about earlier... By the way, liberals are actually conservatives. If you're upholding the system, you're a conservative. This is a system that is inherently right-wing. So if in most of the actions you're doing, you're not trying to break it down or change it, you're inherently conservative. It doesn't matter if you are okay with gay people and black people. You're inherently conservative. And I'm not even saying that as a, as a diss or a dig. Like, lots of my friends are liberals and are essentially good people. But I'm just saying you have bought in more than you think you have. You think you're fighting, but you're not fighting anything, right? And you fight harder 
against people who had the audacity to suggest that we can and should and must do fucking better by everyone. Think about how hard the Democrats and, you know, like capital D Democrats, Democratic Party people fought, how hard they fought against, you know, Bernie Sanders and to a lesser degree, Elizabeth Warren in the primaries versus how hard they're fighting against Trump now. You're kidding me, right? It's like night and day. Okay. It's like that meme where, <laughs> where, you know, you have the toy dinosaur, right? And then you have the T-Rex and they're the toy dinosaur when they're fighting Trump and the giant T-Rex when they're fighting progressives. But at any rate, we need to be thinking and doing so much more right now than just voting. Because there's, ob there's the obvious fascist stuff that we got to watch out for. And this is just like, you know, when the Weimar Republic shifted over into being Nazi Germany. For a lot of people, this is the shit they don't talk about that much. For a lot of people, life remained essentially the same, right? The cinemas kept going. I mean, you know, certainly there are things you couldn't show in them, but the stores were still open. Day-to-day -day life, other than the more ubiquitous presence of heavily armed soldiers and a knowledge of to some degree, of what was going on outside the borders, life continued. And it was harder when I was younger to see how that could happen, but now it's really, really easy because right now at our borders, right the fuck now at our borders, okay, they are gassing these people with HDQ neutral. I've talked about that before. Go back to a previous podcast to hear about that. Performing hysterectomies. And there's a long, long, long medical precedent to doing unwanted surgeries and sterilizing, uh, air quotes, unwanted populations. So this is not new. It's just worse. All that's happening right now under our watch. Okay. So, and I, and I mean, I add myself in this. The fact that we haven't stormed these places and gotten those people out is a little stain of guilt on all of us. Right. And yes, there is the feeling that we don't know what to do. And we're terrified of what the government would do to us if we did that. Of course we are. And we should be. But the fact that we are afraid of them to that degree shows you how perilous things already are. But they're going to get worse. And again, the election for me, let me just do a quick breakdown of how it could go. A, Biden wins cleanly. Trump isn't going to leave probably without someone literally taking him out of there. And if he does, the cult that has formed around him is going to go absolutely apeshit. And I mean, they have lots of guns. They are in cahoots with police. The NYPD endorsed fucking 45. And in, in New York City is supposedly the most fucking liberal, progressive, whatever you want to call it, city in the country. And in this city... The police are in cahoots with fascism. They're down and they're doing it right now. They are beating ass in the streets, right? So what do you think is going to happen in some tiny, small ass town in Missouri? They are going to reject the election. They are going to take control by force of their local jurisdiction and they will have the backing of local police and perhaps even local military. Who knows? Same thing. If it's contested, if the election is contested, you get the same result, except for there is, you know, it, it's just even more of a mess, right? And that's the most likely scenario because uh, not to get too far into it, but just how it's likely to happen is that 45 is likely to get more votes in person because more Democrats are trying to vote by mail uh, because of COVID and because of, you know, just for reasons, right? And so if the mail imbalance aren't all counted on election night, and it looks like Trump has won. But then after the mail-in ballots are counted, it's clear that Biden has won. Well, then, you know, we will all know what has happened because we, we know it's more likely that Biden's going to get more votes. I mean, l let's keep it a buck, right? More people will vote for Biden. That doesn't, that doesn't seem questionable. I don't think he's going to win, but I think more people are going to vote for him, right? But contested, it being contested means that, and, and then there's all kinds of tricks they can pull. Like I, I think I talked about in, um, might have been an Instagram live, but at any rate, 
they have tricks. And one of the tricks is just getting it to go to a vote of the states, refusing to certify in some states, and it goes to a vote in the House of Representatives, where every state gets one vote. There are more Republican votes than Democratic votes. The Republicans win. Trump is installed again, fair and square. Or, you know, again, air quotes, fair and square. So, right. And then if 45 wins cleanly, that's... Oh, that's probably the worst scenario, actually. Now, the, the contested scenario is not the worst. The worst is if he does appear to win cleanly, because then the military will be basically duty and honor bound to enforce whatever he says to do. And that's going to be cleaning out places. And then people like myself who have, you know, I have way too much documented shit online talking about this, how fucked up this country is for me to survive purges. And like, I'm not, you know, I don't flatter myself that I have that much reach or that I matter that much, but I'm a card carrying member of some groups that are gonna get fucking purged because that's what they're gonna do. That's the next step in the fucking playbook. It's a very clear playbook, right? We are, you know, as, as, the, um, as the meme goes, we are currently failing an open book test. There's no ambiguity. Right. The, I mean, there's definitely more things added on to the situation, but we really are the Weimar Republic about to become the Third Reich. And it's hard to argue against that at this point, at least not, you know, honorably. And I mean, yes, there's shades of Mussolini in there. And yes, we have the pandemic. And yes, we have the Great Depression. You're right. We have all these things that are added to the situation, but it is what it is. And we're really there. So. Let me wrap up by saying this. Whatever you're doing to get out the vote, don't lose those numbers of people that you meet doing those efforts. Keep them. You know, keep them in your phone. Use Signal. Use the encrypted methods. I talked a while back about info security. Go back to that episode, check it out, and use it. Start using it right now. Because in most of the scenarios that are going to play out, you're going to need it. And after the voting is done, you we can't just expect to go into the streets and be like, well, you lost. You got to leave. They're not going to fucking listen. They never listen. And I'm not talking shit on protest in general because it's vital. We have to do it. But they're not going to listen. It's going to need to be more dramatic than all that. And while that's happening, we're going to need to think about what happens if they try to cut off cities. I mean, let's think logically. How many ways are there to get into New York? How, how easy would it be to literally cut off New York if we're, we've already been de declared an anarchist jurisdiction? That's legal. That's legally. That's like the president fucking said it. So anything that happens to us now, they can treat us like we are like terrorists that have bombed, you know, some American building on some Guantanamo Bay shit, literally like not, this is not a drill. Okay. So if you think just your vote is going to do enough, you're sadly mistaken and you need to do more. You need to organize. You need to strategize. You need to think about what you're going to really do. Because again, voting is vital, but it's also the absolute bottom in the step of things that we need to do to protect each other and to make our world better. Because we already agree and we know that the, that our government is not sane that it's not just, that it's not right, and it's not reasonable. We know this. We don't disagree about that for the most part. So then why do we trust representatives to do that? Why do we put so much weight on voting when we know that we're voting for people to do what we know they're not going to do? It's, it's highly illogical, and a lot of it is just that people want to stay in denial about how dangerous things are and about how you just aren't doing what you need to be doing. And I'm not blaming you for that because the world is set up to break us. It's set up to break us down. It's set up to make us too tired, right? We have to work day in and day out just to survive, right? Conditions are terrible. We have to fight against each other. So I am not blaming you for feeling like there's not much you can do. And I say everything that I say with love as, look, we can do more. We can do better. And we can do more for each other. And it actually will make our lives easier not more difficult, if we're actually getting involved in some more real ways. I'm going to end there because we've already somehow hit an hour. 
But folks, friends, we've never lived through anything like this situation before. And history does not repeat itself, but it stands as off in rhyme. And somehow this moment rhymes with a whole lot of really, really bad ones. And because things escalate over time, right? America's far more powerful than the Third Reich ever was or could have been because technology is better, because we have military bases all over the world, because we have more money than any country has ever had, right? We are a danger to human life on the planet. The planet will be fine. It will shake us off like dandruff and continue to spin on its axis for millions of years. So we got to stop saying we're going to kill the planet. We'll, but we can kill ourselves. We haven't even touched on climate change. So get ready, get prepared, prepare for yourself, prepare for your neighbors, prepare for your friends and family, and understand that this is going to be very, very dramatic. And the kind of thing that not all of us are going to survive. And Yes, I am appealing to emotion, but that's also just the truth. And that's going to bring us to the end of today's episode. Please do keep up with me on Instagram, at Focused on Infinity, on Twitter, at Watcher Infinite, and please do support my Patreon where I'm going to be doing some more video and I'm actually going to do more live streams and things of that nature. Um, I've had some inspiration. Shout out to everyone who has lost people to COVID, to any of the grievous conditions we're dealing with now, and to all of us who are going to lose people because unfortunately, the grim milestones we've reached of 200,000 dead from COVID, it's going to be twice that at least by the time this is over, just in this country. Please stay safe, wear a mask, skip the trip if you can. Much love to you, sending blessings and protection. Grendel out. <laughs>